what happens? You get prosecuted federally. You get in deep trouble. In the comments section on my video about Windows 11 must be stopped, you know, this one. A lot of you had a lot of things to say, and I want to get back to at least some of you on the points that you made. Before I get into it, the first thing I want to point out is that the Windows 11 must be stopped video blew up about nine to 10 months after it was made. It was published in June or July of 2021, but I'm currently recording this in the middle of May 2022. So a lot has happened since the publication of the video, and a lot of you are calling me out for things that have changed since the video came out. The video came out before Windows 11 was officially released to manufacturing. The first big misunderstanding that I need to clear up is about UEFI, Secure Boot, and the Trusted Platform Module. A lot of people misunderstood what I was saying to say something to the effect of UEFI is evil, Secure Boot is super evil, and the Trusted Platform Module is the Illuminati that's going to eat your soul through your computer. That's not the case at all. UEFI is just an upgraded version of what we call the BIOS, or some people call it the CSM now because that's UEFI's sort of compatibility layer for a BIOS, for the old style way of booting. Ultimately, UEFI by itself is just a different and more intelligent way of booting a computer. UEFI code can understand file systems, so it can load a whole file from a disk and run that, instead of the old way that dates back to 1980s PCs, where it would load one single first sector of the first disk in the system and put control over that, and then that was responsible for finding the right disk and then loading the next thing, and it was this long, complicated thing, and now UEFI means you can just load a file directly into memory and run it, as an operating system bootloader or whatever, instead of having to do this chaining sector nonsense that dates back God knows how long. UEFI is not evil, it's great, but it happens to come with, due to Microsoft requirements for Windows 8 certification, Secure Boot. Secure Boot is also not a bad thing inherently not a bad thing. It's just a tool. It's a way for you to put a signature into UEFI so that whenever your computer tries to load up your operating system, you know that first file that UEFI loads from the disk and is much smarter and therefore can find an actual file and load it? Well, it can also run a security check on it. That file can contain a signature. That signature can be checked against what's stored in UEFI. If the signature doesn't match, UEFI can reject the file and say, hey, hey, someone's modified your bootloader. You might want to look into this. You might have a security breach. They might be trying to rootkit your computer. That was a big problem back in the days of XP. Boy, oh boy, you could get a rootkit shoved into your master boot record. And next thing you know, your system is owned from early boot, which means no antivirus could stop it unless you had some way to boot into one that didn't involve booting the infected system at all, and so on and so forth. I actually used to do this with my Tritech service system Linux distribution, which the public version out of date if you go looking for that, but to this day I still use that for most of my computer servicing needs. So Secure Boot makes it possible for you to sign the bootloader, put the key for that signed bootloader into UEFI, and make sure at every boot that what's being booted is what you signed and not something that an attacker put in there to hijack your whole computer early in the process where they have control of literally everything your computer does. But Jody, I hear you exclaim, in the last video you made it sound like Secure Boot meant that you couldn't use your computer and you didn't own it and all sorts of evil would happen and the Illuminati would be in my butt for some reason. I don't know how they got there, but they're there and triangles hurt. Here's the thing about security tools, any given security tool, UEFI Secure Boot, Trusted Platform Modules, Full Disk Encryption, System Passwords, Two-Factor Authentication, they can be used for or against the user, and whether they're good or evil depends entirely on who is using them for what purpose. Who is controlling the lock and key? Who is it that they're keeping in or out? Who is it that is allowed or denied based on this control mechanism? 
That's the problem with security. The same security that you can use to keep people out, like a door lock and key on your house, can also be used to keep you out of your own house if someone shows up and changes the locks. But these things aren't inherently evil, they are just tools. The third item I discussed, the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM, that too is not inherently evil. The TPM is basically just a device used to store secrets. You can store passwords or security keys, encryption keys, anything in there that you want to that you don't want to be easy to access if the system that you booted up to is not approved, so to speak. I don't want to get too far into this, but the simple version of the TPM or Trusted Platform Module is that when you boot Windows and you've got Secure Boot turned on, the bootloader passes the signature check, the TPM releases the keys. It will let go of full disk encryption keys or whatever that Windows is allowed to have, that Windows stored there and then can retrieve once the bootloader is sure, hey, the code I'm booting is the same code that I booted that loaded this stuff before. So we'll let the keys go for that, but if you stick a flash drive in and boot from that, the TPM remains locked and it won't let those keys go. This can be useful. This can keep someone from putting a tainted bootloader on your system, again, and hijacking it and getting the disk encryption keys, thereby bypassing your security. But it can also be used, and this is my fear, to allow Microsoft to lock you out of your own disk. And if Microsoft can lock you out of your own disk, forcing you to go through Windows and you don't have the recovery key for whatever reason. You don't have access to the Microsoft account the key is stored in for whatever reason. Microsoft <laughs> bans you from a Microsoft account or deletes your account that contains your keys. You didn't write the keys down because you didn't know about it, whatever. If for any reason you don't have the recovery key for BitLocker and something goes wrong, you lose all your data on your drive. That's the problem with Secure Boot and the TPM. Just as you can use them to lock out others, so you can end up finding yourself locked out. And the only solution is to lose everything, wipe your computer, and start over. The concern that I'm trying to address with the original video is that since about 2005, when it was called TCPA and Palladium, there has been a push by Microsoft and other large vendors to lock down computer security to where the boot chain from the hardware level up is trusted. There's an excellent paper from way back then by Richard Stallman of the GNU project fame, Free Software Foundation, etc., which ends in a sentence something to the effect of, so a trusted computer means basically a computer that can break your security? Yes, that's a nice way of putting it. The big question is, is the computer being trusted against the user, or is the user able to trust the computer? This is the problem. Who controls the trust in what direction? Since 05, there's been this push to put in what we now have as Secure Boot and the Trusted Platform module. Part of Windows 8 certification for Microsoft and vendors to have a Windows 8 ready PC was to have UEFI, Secure Boot on by default, and a trusted platform module so that Windows 8 could take advantage of this secure boot chain. This was because master boot record infections and root kits had become pretty commonplace in the XP era and they locked down some of the controls so that it wasn't so easy to just overwrite the MBR in Vista and 7. But if you move to UEFI, secure boot, etc., now you have authentication at the firmware level. Now you can have Windows 8 boot, and if the Windows 8 key is pre-installed, well, now Windows 8 can boot in a trusted way. Trusted as in Windows 8 knows that its integrity hasn't been compromised from the first item, the bootloader, all the way up the chain. Signature checks, security. This is a good thing for users in general. However, one of the things that they did in Windows 8 certification is require that PC manufacturers let you turn off Secure Boot. It was mandatory that you be able to disable Secure Boot in your UEFI BIOS. You had to be able to do that. Otherwise, you weren't Windows 8 certified, can't have Windows 8, sorry HP, Dell, whoever, no Windows 8 for you if you don't let the user disable Secure Boot. And that's a good thing too. 
Although I have no faith in Microsoft, I assume that that was not something they did entirely by choice, but because they knew that they would have basically hell on earth on their hands if they didn't let power users unlock their systems and do what they wanted with their property. And here we get to my original concern. It's been quite a ride so far, but it's about to land. Windows 11, before release, they said Secure Boot and TPM 2.0 would be mandatory to boot Windows 11. Not just to install it, but that you had to have it to boot. This is what I was reading everywhere. Secure boot or it won't boot. Miraculously, those requirements didn't seem to make it into the final product. We have people booting Windows 11 on Pentium 4s. Oh my God! I don't know why they're doing this, but the point is, Windows 11 does actually work on very old hardware without UEFI, without secure boot. If you hack around it to make it install or you do it some other way, you get the idea. But if Windows 11 had gone through with this mandatory requirement that secure boot could not be turned off or Windows would not work, then you fall into a nasty slippery slope. Now, users who do use another operating system for any reason have to go into the UEFI BIOS and toggle secure boot on and off just to switch which OS they boot. They can't simply turn off Secure Boot all the time and flip-flop between whatever. They have to either configure Secure Boot keys, which is not the simplest thing in the world, uh, definitely beyond a normal person who might want to try out Linux, or they have to turn off Secure Boot, and if Windows 11 won't boot without Secure Boot, well, now you have to toggle, 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 toggle to try out Linux or to install Linux in a dual boot scenario or whatever. Now you're locked into Secure Boot, but in a soft way. In a way that, well, hey, you can still turn off Secure Boot. You can choose to turn off Secure Boot. It's just that Windows 11 won't boot without Secure Boot turned on. So now you're inconvenienced if you happen to do anything involving booting not Windows 11. From there, it's just one simple step to lock you out of user choice to convert your general purpose PC into no longer a general purpose PC that you fully control. And that step? Mandatory secure boot. Yes, you could still potentially install keys, but hey, for how long, right? If the process of locking you out of your own computer, not making it so you can install software of your choice, operating systems of your choice, were some kind of a big hill, it's a big hill, right? Okay? So it's a big hill. We have come this far down the slope. You literally have two more steps and you are at rock bottom. Make Secure Boot mandatory and not user controllable and make it so the user can't put in their own custom keys. Now you have a Windows only machine. From there, it's just a few more years, Microsoft changing their dev tools, changing Windows, to where now you can't run non-UWP, Universal Windows Platform, Windows 10 style apps. To where Windows only supports newer software, not older software, and guess where you can get that software from? Microsoft's Microsoft Store and nowhere else. Bam, control complete. Your computer is now just a glorified iPhone controlled by Microsoft. If you've ever heard that phrase, boiling the frog, where they talk about if you try to boil a frog by turning the heat all the way up, it'll jump out. But if you boil it slowly, it'll just lie there and die. That's what's happening. Okay, moving on from the most crucial point, let's discuss a few other things. The Surface RT was a tablet created by Microsoft, sold by Microsoft, and that contains Windows 8, but not really. It was called Windows RT. It was an ARM-only special version of Windows 8. It couldn't run normal executables the way that classic Windows 8 or 7 or anything like that before it could. Windows RT and the Microsoft Surface RT that it ran on top of are locked down hardware. Yes, I'm aware that there are hacks available to get around it, but that's not the point. The point is that officially, everything's locked down tight. You can't install your own system. And if you do want to use those hacks, it's not simple. You have to do some downgrading, you have to exploit security vulnerability, to hack the bootloader, blah, 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 blah. The Surface RT was locked down to Microsoft Store only. 
people who have the Surface RT got screwed. They didn't release future Windows versions for the Surface RT. There's not enough storage to stick Windows 10 on it. You have to open the thing up and shove a card in it, and all, it's, just, it's an insider preview thing, blah, blah, blah. If you got a Surface RT, you couldn't run anything but Microsoft approved software that was through the Microsoft Store, and you got no upgrades, and you were locked out from running Linux or any other operating system. You were screwed. That was it. It's already happened, man. It wasn't an Intel platform or an AMD platform. It was an ARM platform, a completely different CPU architecture you commonly see on phones. But the point is we've already been there. We already have devices with locked out bootloaders and the Surface RT was a Windows device with a locked out bootloader. If you wanna see what the future that I'm talking about is like, <laughs> go take a look at the Surface RT and how people feel about it today. All right. I get to talk about iOS devices, the iPhone, the iPad, etc. What can't you do on an iOS device that you can do on a PC or even a Mac or Android devices even through side loading but also just because the Google Play Store is more permissive. The big things that come to mind are emulators for video game systems and torrent clients. You can't download either of these things but there are a couple of other things you can't do. For example, hacked apps. You can't use the now discontinued YouTube Vanced app that was available on Android phones and that you could sideload. Another interesting real world example that maybe a few more of you are affected by is Telegram. If you download the Telegram app through the Google Play Store, there are certain groups that aren't allowed to be shown. There's certain content that Telegram has to block you from because if they don't block you from that content, regardless of whether or not you want to see it, Google will ban their app from the Google Play Store. Store. But if you go to Telegram's website and download the app through there and sideload it onto your Android phone, a sideloaded Telegram does not have to adhere to the terms of service for Google's Play Store. They are not restricted by this big corporation's sometimes fairly arbitrary restrictions. They don't attempt to protect you from the world, keep you from seeing things you shouldn't see because the corporate overlords say you shouldn't see them, and it's all because you can sideload the Telegram app. In that way, you can do more things with an, even an Android phone because of sideloading. But iOS, a totally locked down platform, the Surface RT, a totally locked down platform, Windows in the future, Windows 12 with Microsoft Store only software distribution, who knows? Will you be able to run torrent clients, game emulators, unrestricted discussion software? Will you even be able to visit all the websites on the global internet, maybe, if the overlords let you, and that's the problem. You should control your hardware. You own your hardware. You should own your copy of the software. We'll get to that in a minute, too. Let's discuss some of the stupid things that I've seen in the comments. Stop being old. Things change. Progress happens. Whether you like it or not, get over it. This is modern stuff. Changes are necessary. Things need to change all the time. Change is good. Stop being a stagnant old critter. I'm 12 years old and what is this? This bullshit appeal to modernity, I'm really tired of seeing it. It doesn't do anything to tell me that I'm old. It doesn't really do anything to say, oh, progress is you know, happening. You can, just, you can lead, follow, or get out of the way, man. It doesn't make a difference. See, the problem is that not all progress is good. If progress means locking you up in a room in isolation and keeping you away from other people because it'll keep you from getting sick if you're locked in a room all by yourself and you never see other people again, that's pretty universally understood to be an evil thing to do. But it's progress, man. Progress is not always good. If something is good, and you progress to something worse, it's progress, but it's negative progress. This weird appeal to things needing to constantly be new, it doesn't make any sense. It, it is the most intellectually void argument I've seen in the comments. I'm tired of seeing it. If you make the argument that things need to progress, that things need to be newer, that things need to look cooler, you're stupid. 
I'm not going to argue with you. You can have your opinion, and your opinion's stupid. That's my opinion. Get over it, man. By the way, I've heard it all. You can call me bald, old, fat, basement dweller. I really don't care. Insults roll right off my back. Go check out my Star Trek ship posting saga videos about that one. I really don't care what you call me. The cloud is the future! Uh, the cloud is the way that things are gonna go! Progress! Progress! The cloud, the cloud, the cloud! There's a mystical cloud, this bunch of freaking water vapor that has terabytes of storage for some reason. <laughs> And that's the way that things are going, man. You just need to get over it. Yeah, okay. I, I get it. You think the cloud is cool. There's, the cloud is really just someone else's computer, but it's totally awesome because you just throw things at the cloud and it just gets stuck up there. Wow. Oh, look. Oh, no, uh, it's not coming down for some reason. And why is that? Because guess what the cloud doesn't work with? Internet outages. <laughs> You can't reach the cloud when the internet's out, baby. So what happens then? Well, you better pray that whoever it is that set up your cloud garbage has some kind of offline caching that happens to have cached what you need. Sketchy broadband speeds! You too can have access to the cloud, and whenever you need to put a gigabyte of video footage that you took on your phone, when you, when you stick that in your documents and it needs to go up to the cloud, and then it needs to come right back down from the cloud a day or two later, or whatever, and you're on DSL, kind of, sort of, you know, five miles out of the town or whatever, you get 1.5 megabits down, yeah, that file's gonna take all day to go up and down. The cloud is not so great if you actually need to be able to use it and your internet is not that great. What happens to all your cloud stuff if you lose access to your account? Or worse yet, for some reason your service provider doesn't like you or doesn't agree with something that you do, and you get banned from the service. This is not fiction. This has happened primarily to right-wing people, but this has happened. People, for their political beliefs, for their videos or something they posted to Facebook, have gotten banned from all sorts of cloud services, web hosting services, banking services. This extends much further than this discussion realistically can encompass, but the problem is that if you get banned from your cloud service for whatever reason, or you lose access to your account, it's hacked, uh, it's two-factor authentication, and you don't have the same phone number, and there's no other way to get it back, you don't have backup codes. If you lose access, be it accidental or malicious, you're screwed. You just, you lose it. All the stuff in the cloud, gone. You better have a local copy, you better have a local backup, <laughs> or you've lost all your data. You're screwed. The last problem I want to bring up with the cloud is far more sinister. And perhaps you think it's not a problem, but no, it's not a problem for you until it happens to be at some point in the future when you least expect it. You lose your United States Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure. The protections in the law that protect you from unreasonable search and seizure do not protect a third party on your behalf. This is a big loophole in the Constitution of the United States that has yet to be resolved. If you store data on your computer, it's part of your effects. It's part of your stuff. And if you've got that under lock and key, if you've got it encrypted or whatever, they can't do anything to force you to divulge your password. If it's not encrypted, they still have to have a search warrant to seize your computer and to get access to the data on it, or to use some sort of a network investigative technique to virus up your computer with FBI viruses so that they can inspect your stuff behind your back. But the point is, all that still has to go through a judicial process and you have recourse. You have no recourse under United States law if the FBI subpoenas Google and they get access to your data through Google. Google's rights as far as defending your data against search and seizure are far more limited. And if you really think about it, why would Google bother? Why would Google do more than the absolute bare minimum to try and protect the sanctity of their services, perhaps? But they don't care about you. They don't care about your data. They're not going to go to bat for you. Google's going to hand that crap over to the FBI when a subpoena lands in their mailbox, and that's going to be the end of it, and they don't care. Your data on cloud services is 
completely open to the government using a warrant against the cloud provider to get unfettered access without you being able to do anything to challenge it. So your stuff is not private against the government when it's stored on someone else's property. You put your stuff in the cloud, not only do you subject yourself to potential outages, slowness, other issues, but you literally give up your rights under the law to keep it safe from the government. Here's another fun one. Backwards compatibility. Urgh. Backwards compatibility needs to be eliminated because it's holding back progress. Backwards compatibility is evil. Backward compatibility is holding us back. They need to stop with the backward compatibility. I have seen so many dumb comments saying that backward compatibility needs to be eliminated. It's not that simple. You can't just strip all the backward compatibility out of Windows. Second of all, backward compatibility doesn't hold things back the way that you might seem to think. Backward compatibility is part of continuous integration and testing. Basically, if you have old software, all they have to do is include it in a test set where they continuously, as they make changes to the existing software packages, the you know, Windows libraries or whatever, they have thousands upon thousands of pieces of software that they run automated tests against to see if they break. And if they break, they know that their change broke old software, so they just figure out why it broke it and work around it. The only time that backward compatibility tends to technically hold you back is, for example, if you have a newer CPU that has new instructions, like uh, AVX, for example. If you're doing video encoding, you can speed it up with certain AVX, AVX2 instructions. But older CPUs don't have that. So typically what will happen is where the optimization can take advantage of this new stuff, you'll have a split you'll have a common code path here, right? And up to this point, every processor runs basically the same code, but where there can be optimized versions for certain functions, you have it split into multiple paths. So this path here might be the classic path, the original, the one that works on all chips or most chips or whatever, things up to like SSE2, so that it can work really far back. This other path, can be the optimized version with AVX, 512, or whatever. And you can have as many of those as you need for things that can take advantage of it. Old stuff versus new stuff, all you're doing is you have to write the new code for the new thing anyway. So what's the problem here? You just detect which CPU you're on, what they support, and you tweak what you do depending on what the processor supports. And you have multiple paths based on what the processor can or cannot do. Yes, it adds some maintenance overhead, but not much. Once the thing's written and tested, you largely don't have to deal with it anymore unless you want to optimize it further or for some reason it's doing the wrong thing anyway. Backward compatibility is not as big of a problem as some people make it out to be. So I don't know where they're getting this. I assume that these people have never actually written and maintained and distributed a program widely to hundreds of thousands of users. Hello? Hello? I maintain a program called JDupes, a duplicate scanner. It's literally in hundreds and hundreds of distribution repos for Linux or whatever. It's available for Windows, it's available for Mac OS, whatever. You can get it through Homebrew, and hundreds of thousands of people use this program that I wrote every single day. I have to deal with backward compatibility, and you know what? I do it intelligently. I support the old options as much as I can. If the old options are dumb or dangerous, whatever, I chuck them. But I make it so that they can choose whether or not they use the old version that supports it or the new version that doesn't. So sometimes along the way you do have to break a few things. But completely ditching backward compatibility because somehow it's going to make things modern, somehow it's going to not hold us back from nebulous progress that no one can actually explain, it's bullshit. Stop that. Stop, just stop. You do not know what you're talking about, but you're speaking authoritatively as if you do. Stop. Get some help. Oh, here's another fun nugget. Someone or the government should sue or prosecute Microsoft for this. No, that's not how it works. That you're not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but you clearly don't understand anything about the legal system if you think that. They, first of all, they backed off on the requirements. I don't know what to tell you about that. They backed off on the requirements, so the thing that I discussed didn't actually happen, but even if it did, 
it's sketchy as to whether or not you could file any kind of an antitrust suit against them or whatever. First of all, end users, technically you agreed to a license agreement. It sucks, but it's true. Those click wrap licenses, eh, they probably restrict you from filing suit at all. If Microsoft tells manufacturers they have to do something, or they don't get a copy of Windows 11 to put on their computer and sell that computer to you, you don't have a lawsuit. You're not the party that made that agreement with Microsoft. You're the one buying it from Dell or HP or whoever. <laughs> you have to be damaged to sue someone successfully. Microsoft isn't causing you damages just from telling manufacturers they have to make secure boot mandatory, which they haven't done. The changes have to come from us staying on Windows 10 or moving to Linux or whatever. If you want to see the change, you have to do something to stop it. And it might hurt a little, but the change has to be done by the users. You can't rely on the government to do it, and you probably can't sue Microsoft to make it happen. So, I don't want to hear it. Oh, here's another one. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. World Economic Forum. I understand. I get the sentiment. In a way, I agree with you. I don't know that it's part of that ridiculous plan, that sinister... You know, I, I won't call it a conspiracy theory, they literally said it, but I just, I get the sentiment, but I don't think that it really has a place here, and even if it does, a hundred other people already said that in the comments before you, please just stop posting it. Stop posting it, okay? I get it. I understand. Calm down. Stop posting it. In a macOS 11.2 update, Apple unlocked Apple Silicon bootloaders. Yes, that means that Linux does run on M1 Macs now. You can stop telling me about that. Asahi Linux does run on Apple Silicon Macs. They've gotten it to a point where it's usable. The video is 10 months old. Cut me some slack. Yes, I understand. I understand that you can run Linux on a Mac. I understand that they let go of the platform. I also understand that Microsoft is the one that chooses not to make Windows available on an M1 Mac. I understand that Microsoft has an exclusivity agreement with Qualcomm that prevents them from doing so. I get it. Thank you for the comments. Here it is in the update. Now we can stop talking about it. Asahi Linux, probably something you should check out if you have an M1 Mac. Why are you buying Apple products? Why? Apple hates you. They love your wallet. They freaking hate you. A lot of people brought up Lewis Rossman and Right to Repair. I would like to point out first of all that I made an older video that was actually aimed at Lewis Rossman trying to talk to him about right to repair stuff. I sent him a message with the link to it. I never got any kind of attention or response. So, you know, I tried. But I think Lewis Rossman and the right to repair movement are great, but I don't think that they quite have everything that they need in their wheelhouse. I think that right to repair needs to add right to ownership as part of that, which includes the software running on the hardware. And I don't want to talk too much about it because this is just an update video, but the long story short of my opinion on this is that you should have ownership rights in the software. The software that you run on your computer, you should have ownership rights. You should own your copy. No, I get it. It's licensed, not sold. You don't own Windows. No, you don't own Windows, but you own your copy of Windows. Right to repair can be limited by the anti-circumvention clause of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. You're not allowed to circumvent a copyright protection measure. So manufacturers put copyright protection measures into the software and hardware to prevent you from being able to extract the code and look at it and work on it and put new code in there. They can't stop you from doing that normally, but if they put something in there that they can label an anti-circumvention measure in there, then you're breaking federal law by doing so. If you hack your tractor or whatever, if you hack your ECU and then it's got a key that prevents you from getting in. Also, copyright law recognizes certain property rights over your copy. You have the first sale doctrine, and you have the provision where you can make a backup copy for archival purposes. Copyright law does recognize ownership of copies. The problem is that there is not a more general recognition of ownership of copies. I, and this is a philosophical argument, not a legal one, 
I think, I believe, it is my opinion that you should have complete ownership rights of your copy of software. If you own a phone, you should own the software that's on that phone. Not the software in general, but your copy. You should have unlimited rights to decompile, to rip the software, to replace the software. You should have government protected rights to take that software off, to put new software on, to make hacks and mods and such to that software. Likewise, if you buy hardware, you should have unlimited rights to hack or modify or change your piece of hardware to do whatever you want. If you think that this discussion is just a little bit too theoretical or unlikely or whatever, I'd like to point you to mod chips for game consoles. What happens if you put mod chips in game consoles? What happens if you sell mod chips for game consoles? A piece of hardware that you own and then someone sells you or you sell to someone else a device, a piece of hardware that they will then own that they could then put into a piece of hardware that they also own. What happens? You get prosecuted federally. You get in deep trouble. I think that that action should be completely protected under the law. I think that the DMCA's anti-circumvention provision is complete bullshit and it needs to go. It needs to be destroyed. It is a violation of your rights. It is way too broad. It violates your private property rights. If you're one of the people who commented on how I pronounce Linux, 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 Lunix, Lonix, Linux, Linux, well, I may have posted a URL to Linus Torvalds pronouncing it. I even made a video making fun of the whole concept of we mispronounce a word when the guy who made it says that Hey, you can pronounce it however you want. But um, at this point, what I've done is, unless you had some other substance to your comment and you were just remarking on my pronunciation, probably being a dick in doing so, I've just banned you from the channel. So, sorry, but you know, the video wasn't about that and I got tired of seeing 10 comments a day with people typing Lin Ox. A lot of people have asked about the user interface documentary that I promised at the end of the Windows 10 video. Yes, I'm still working on it. Progress has been slow. I've been doing a lot of things that have nothing to do with video production. Plus, it's pretty easy to get demoralized when you look at your channel and it doesn't really grow that much. This Windows 11 video blowing up has actually inspired me to renew my effort and put more time into it. But the problem with the UI documentary is that user interfaces are actually a pretty complicated field. And my biggest problem is not finding what to put in it so much as deciding what not to put in. You may remember, um, or you may not have even heard, I don't know. I think it was Stephen Hawking's publisher who famously told him that every equation you put inside your book is going to reduce your readership by half. That's kind of the problem with the UI documentary because if I start talking about you know, affordances or whatever, and I go too deep into it, people are gonna be like, no, this is boring. I don't want this academic crap. I was hoping for a, a nice, light, interesting, but not, you know, I, w I don't wanna get beaten over the head with a college textbook about user interfaces sucking. I just wanted a video that kind of confirms what I've been feeling for a long time and gives me more of the language and the information that I need to articulate my feelings to other people about how things have gotten worse over the past decade or so. So that's where I'm at. Stay tuned, it will come out. I have no promises as to when at this point, but it will come out, you will be happy. Quality takes time. <laughs> and I'm a busy dude. Two last things. Uh, I learned that some people like careful, slow speech that is intentional, that is enunciated carefully, that is easy for them to understand even if they don't really pay a lot of attention to it. And other people like it whenever you talk really fast like this. So when I made the remark about speed up the video, I talk slow. Some people appreciated my slow cadence that was more careful. And some people appreciated that I gave them the heads up that you can speed things up. I may do that in more videos in the future, but just something interesting to note. A lot of people have a lot of different preferences about how fast you talk. And lastly, I've gotten several emails about sponsorships. I've even gotten a couple of emails and form fill outs on my business page for my computer business 
asking me if I would employ people. Uh, no, I'm not accepting any sponsorships, and no, I'm not employing anyone. All my businesses are businesses of one. I used to have employees, and now I don't. And for the foreseeable future, that's going to stay that way. Maybe when things get a little bigger, maybe I'll need some help, but right now is not the time. So please, no sponsorships, no employment. Contact me about it, I'm probably just not going to respond. And I'm sorry, but there it is. Whew, yeah, I never guessed that uh, literally one page of bullet points would take this long to put together. But there you go, my Windows 11 must be stopped follow-up is finally over. Oh my god, it's taken me a week just to slog through all the comments, make these notes, make sure I didn't miss anything important, and I'm sure there's more to be said. Um, you should go to my channel and look at, if you haven't seen it yet, a couple of videos back, there's one that I did about you had a choice and you chose to use Windows or Mac OS. If you were interested in the Windows 11 video, you were interested in this follow-up, that video is also something that I think you should watch. It kind of is a follow-up of its own. But it's a point that was so important, I felt like it needed its own video, and I think that you should check it out. You know the drill, though. Like, comment, subscribe, go to jodybruchon.com for ways to support me financially. The more financial support I receive, the more of this video stuff I can do, and the less of this computer repair stuff I can focus on. Maybe I can get to a point where I can do nothing but make really cool UI documentaries all day, every day for you. But it's gonna cost you, you know. I need that green, boys. All right, thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day, and once again, I really appreciate you. Have a good one. <laughs>